Good afternoon, church. Welcome to King of the Nations. Thank you so much for joining. And uh, yeah, we, um, we miss you. We miss coming together here and worshiping together as a body. We miss seeing faces. We miss giving each other high fives, giving each other hugs. But we're so happy that you have decided to join us today. Let us just lift up the name of Jesus right now before we begin worship. Jesus, we thank you, God, that your name is the truth, that your name is the light, that your name is peace. Father, we have come to worship you. So I ask that you continue to pour out your love into the households that worship your name. Let your presence rest in their houses right now, God. Let your presence fall. And let it be a tangible, tangible presence that they can, they can hold on to. That they can feel in their heart. We thank you, Jesus, for your glory. Your name is the only name that we lift on high. Your name is the only name that we come to worship. So we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good afternoon, King of the Nations. Pastor Greg is here. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. How are you doing today? I'm excited. My heart is stirred. I sense the grace of God. I want to thank uh, our brother for leading worship today, Jeremy and his team. Uh, I love it. I love it. I love people just entering in through the grace of God, ministering to the Lord. And if you're having a bad morning, if you're having a bad weekend, I got good news. Everything can shift right now, okay? So let's give over to the Lord what's bad, what isn't going right, the devil's attacks, the things that are just causing you to lose your way and take your eyes off of Jesus. Let's just give that to him right now, amen? Because I know we all have days like that, and I know I'm speaking to a few people who are having a day like that. So I just want to encourage you, the grace of God is here just to fix your gaze on Jesus and, um, and receive. We're in the midst of a series on heaven. This is part two. If you didn't watch last week's message, I want to encourage you to watch it. It's very, very important. And today, the title of this teaching is called The Moment You Die. The moment you die. Now, don't run off. <laughs> don't leave me alone. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Don't, don't freak out. This is a very important message, and it's very biblical. The moment that you die. It's appointed on the man to die once, and then comes judgment. So each one of us has an appointment. If the Lord tarries, we're going to go the way of the undertaker. Amen? And uh, if the Lord comes back tomorrow, then we're going to be caught up with him in the sky, and, and that's... We'll talk more about that next week. Before I get in this message, this afternoon, or I'm sorry, this morning I was praying and uh, was just really just stirred by just the word, how the Holy Spirit is training us through this trial, through this pandemic. He's training us. He's seeking to mature us. He's seeking to establish our faith and see it grow and, and develop and and, and have authority and power through it, through the faith that, that we have. And he's doing all of this so that we might become, now I'm speaking in general for the, the entire church, the entire body of Christ, but the Lord is seeking to train us so that we would be a voice to our nation. And so I'm, I'm just really stirred by this because there's a lot of hopelessness, and I've talked a lot about this over the weeks. There is a lot of hopelessness in the land. There's a lot of division in the land. There's a lot of fear in the land. There's a lot of anger in the land. But a people that have been trained by the Holy Spirit, that's raised up in due season to be that voice, that prophetic voice, that, that, that voice of comfort, that voice of mercy, that voice of authority, will bring about change to our nation. And so I just want to encourage you, 
embrace the trial of your faith, embrace the dealings of the Holy Spirit, allow him to go deep, allow the stuff that doesn't belong to come to the surface, and he'll do the rest. And let's just submit to the training and preparation of the Lord. Amen? Oh, that's not my message, but it's very much on my heart. Turn with me to Acts, the seventh chapter. Acts chapter seven. Acts chapter seven, the moment you die. Let's pray. Father, right now, in the name of your son, Jesus, I thank you that we're in the palm of your hands. We belong to you. No one can snatch us out of your hands, your word says. You've written our names on the palm of your hands. And so right now, I pray for your presence, that your grip, your hand of grace, I pray, would be on each one of us now. God, though we're apart, we know that your presence is with us. So Spirit of God, come and rest upon my brothers and sisters. Help me to teach and preach and to, to stir this body up with truth and with revelation about what you have planned for us. And so I bless my brothers and sisters in Jesus' name, and I thank you for their lives. All right, let's go. It was Shakespeare who described death as the undiscovered country from which no traveler returns. I believe that's from Hamlet. This gifted writer put into language words that describe what all of humanity faces. As I taught last week, that death is just a part of our journey. Death is the chariot, I like this, death is the chariot our Heavenly Father sends to bring us to Himself. You can think of Elijah. It is important that we think biblically when it comes to death because correct, correct thinking leads to correct living. Erwin Lutzer, now Erwin Lutzer is an, an elderly gentleman. I had the privilege of, of hearing him preach and teach down in North Carolina a couple years ago. He pastored the Moody uh, Church in Chicago, Illinois. And he, I, I quote from him uh, in this message probably about three times. But it's, it's, it's worthy to listen to his wisdom. And he says this. He says, excuse me, let me get my glasses. It's been one of those mornings. He says this. He says, we cannot overstate the deception perpetuated by the religion of the resuscitated who report only the utopian idea that leads, that death leads to a higher degree of consciousness for all people, regardless of their religion or beliefs, end quote. In other words, just because someone has had a near-death experience doesn't make them an authority on the subject. Satan is called an angel of light, 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 4, who seeks to deceive humanity and lure the masses into a false sense of security. As an example, there was a woman, don't know her name, but she died. And she supposedly met Jesus, and Jesus met Jesus in heaven. And Jesus said to her, let's go for a walk. We'll just call her Susan. Susan, let's go for a walk. So she's in the presence of Jesus, and Jesus turns and looks at her and says, all religions are paths to the same destination. Buddhists have their own path to the, to the destination of heaven, and Hindus, and, and uh, Muslims, and so on and so forth. What's wrong with that? That's universalism. That's been the devil's, devil's mantra and gospel for, for centuries. And we know from Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, we know that salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. So this is what Luther is getting at. This is what I'm seeking to establish here. It's very important as I teach on heaven because there's a lot of voices out there and there's a lot of false voices and there's, there's a, like, it's a different gospel as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11. It's a different spirit. It's a different Jesus. There's a woman named uh, Betty Edie, Betty Edie. And she wrote a book in the 90s. She apparently died. She went to heaven and she met Jesus and it's called Embraced by the Light. But what, what's in her background and what is in her theology is Mormonism and New Age syncretism. And she says that all roads lead to heaven. So just because someone said they saw something and left their body doesn't mean it's gospel, doesn't mean it's a Bible. Listen, when that woman said that Jesus said all roads lead to heaven, 
Basically, what she's declaring is that everything found in the New Testament and the revelation that's found in the Old, it's not true. It's a lie. So we're in a spiritual battle and we can't be gullible and, you know, Hollywood puts on a movie. Oh, that's so sweet. They went to heaven and it's so nice. And there's no Jesus. There's no holiness. There's no fear of God. There's no elders throwing down, uh, throwing their crowns down. (laughs) There's no revelation of the glory of God. It's all humanistic and, and we must reject that and we must be a people that are able in love to communicate what I'm saying effectively so that people can get, get back on track, so that people can come to the knowledge of the truth. To discover and understand the destination, heaven, we need a credible map that has the authority to govern our view of eternity. That map is the Bible. Together today, let's discover what happens the moment a believer dies. The moment a believer dies. We're looking at Stephen. Stephen was a deacon. You can read in Acts chapter 6. The apostles wisely said, listen, we need to give ourselves to prayer in the word. We need to be in the word. We need to be in prayer. We need to be in God's presence. We need to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. And we can't, we can't focus on waiting on tables and, and administrating and serving. We need to empower gifted men to do that. One of those seven men that were raised up was a guy named Stephen. And it says in chapter 6 and verse 8, it says that now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. And then it says opp- opposition arose. Beloved, every time we take steps forward to advance the kingdom out of obedience, every time the Holy Spirit works in us and through us to reveal Jesus, there will be opposition in the spirit. It can happen in the natural realm. It happens in the spiritual realm. That's where it originates from. So Stephen begins to address the Pharisees and the religious rulers of the day and begins to give them a history lesson about Israel and how Israel has continued to reject the revelation that the Father was providing that led all the way to Messiah Jesus coming to earth. And ultimately, they got angry. And look in verse 54, Acts chapter 7, verse 54. Stay with me now. When the members of, members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. What did they hear? Basically, Stephen looks at them and says, you know what? You always resist the Holy Spirit. You always resist the Holy Spirit. You reject God's purpose. You you don't receive it. And then they got angry. Verse 55, it says, but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they cover their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul while they were stoning him. And Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell to his knees. Then he fell to his knees. Then he fell to his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against him. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Stephen was probably no more than 30 years old. I mentioned him last week in the message, and, and what I said was, it's not, not how long we live, it's how we live. And so Stephen is the first martyr in the New Testament church. And there's a lot of lessons we can learn here about what happens the moment we die. And, I, and I, I'm, I'm teaching this today because I want you comforted. I, I want you established in, in an understanding that will bring you peace. And as I go through this message, I know the Holy Spirit's gonna speak very directly to your heart. And some of us struggle with fear. I mentioned that last week as well. Some of us battle the fear of death and, and we're, we're in turmoil. We're, we're, we're walking in anxiety and, and even the thought of COVID. And listen, we need to use wisdom, wear masks, social distancing, all of those good things. And I'll talk more about that in the coming weeks. But 
Some of us are just so afraid that we're going to get sick and we're going to die and we're not walking in peace. And I know that this message is going to help you. All right, lesson from Stephen's departure. Lessons from Stephen's departure. That's what we want to look at. Three specific lessons from Stephen's departure. Number one, when our day comes, the Holy Spirit will be with us. When our day comes, the Holy Spirit will be with us. Look at verse 55. But Stephen, what do you notice there in this passage? But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, (laughs) looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now, there's a principle there in, in our daily lives that it takes the Holy Spirit. It takes God to know God and it takes revelation. We need the Holy Spirit to give us revelation about God's glory and an understanding of of, of who the glorious Father is. That's a whole nother message. But I want you to capture this. this. This so gripped my heart yesterday. When our day comes, our appointed time to die, the Holy Spirit will be with us. Listen to this. It is impossible to die alone when the Holy Spirit is living in us. I know a lot of people have died alone. I know that for a fact. We hear about that. People uh, in in, uh, intensive care units with with COVID and family can't go and and be with them. But I'm going to tell you something. Every believer in Messiah Jesus who has died in the last 11 months in an intensive care unit has not been alone because the Holy Spirit has been with them. Stephen was murdered by Saul and an angry mob. But the Holy Spirit was with him in his final moments on earth. Psalm 23, verse 4 says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 18, The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. It is so good. That is so powerful, guys. That is just awesome. I think, I think that what strikes our heart, what strikes our heart is wondering the when and the how regarding death. I have found that dwelling on something we can't control is not productive. Nowhere in the word of God are we taught to focus on when our departure will be. Paul said, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul knew that he would have sufficient courage to face death because of God's grace. And so will each one of us. There's a form of anxiety. There's a tension, isn't there, in some of us? Because we think about how we're going to die. We think about when we're going to die. And, and there is a tension inside that, that forces us to take on this matter in our mind, trying to carry it, trying to figure it out, trying to navigate, trying, trying to, to resist that which causes us to become unstable internally with fear, and fear makes us unstable. And there's a form of anxiety called Thanophobia, which is characterized by a fear of one's own death or the process of dying. It is referred to as death anxiety. And I have pastored people who have had this this syndrome and this condition. And I'm going to tell you something. We don't have to live with this. Now, I emphasized this last week. We were in Hebrews 2 and verse 14 and 15. You can go there and look after the message. But Jesus, through his finished work, has broken the power of the fear of death. And so to submit to it is literally to resist or not welcome the finished work that Jesus has accomplished so that we can walk free from any form of fear. And so if this describes you, if there's this anxiety, I'm going to tell you that can be broken off of you this morning, this afternoon. Don't carry it. Don't carry it any longer. Erwin Lutzer says, Satan does not have the power of death in the sense that he determines the day that a believer dies. But he has used the fear of death to keep Christians in bondage, unable to approach the the curtain with tranquility, born of the full assurance of faith. Very basic. So the first point, 
When our day comes, the Holy Spirit will be with us. That's a promise. Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit. Remember, the the Holy Spirit is God. He lives in every regenerate believer. Every Christian that's been born again by the Holy Spirit has become the temple of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says in John chapter four that that you, you literally will have a well of living water springing up to eternal life. And you may die in the midst of a crowd and you may die alone, but I'm going to tell you something. The Holy Spirit will be with you. The comforter, the counselor, he will embrace you. He will never leave you. Amen. We need to get that in our spirit, church. We got to stop walking around in fear and anxiety and projection. And I I pastored a guy many, many years ago. I saw the call of God on his life and I wanted to take him to Mexico. And he would not go to Mexico with me. You know why? Because he was afraid of getting on an airplane. What a terrible, terrible place to walk in, being tormented by fear because of the fear of death. Maybe the plane will go down. You know how many people die on American highways? That's a lot more than people than people who die in an air, air crash. Number two, death is a doorway to heaven. Death is a doorway to heaven. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, underscore that. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against him. When he had said this, he fell asleep. There's no heart of revenge. Just like Jesus on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. Do not hold this sin against them. I forgive them. I release them. What an incredible, incredible picture of how we are to walk into forgiveness. Saul is standing right there. You think those words of Stephen and that prayer didn't go down deep into his heart? Probably haunted him every single night. What does that doorway lead to? Death is a doorway to heaven. Listen to this. Lutzer hits it again. Think of how powerless death actually is. Rather than rid us of our wealth, it introduces us to riches eternal. In exchange for poor health, death death gives us a right to the tree of life that is for the healing of the nations, Revelation 22 and verse 2. Death might be temporarily, death might temporarily take our friends from us, but only to introduce us to that land in which there are no goodbyes. I like that. So, what, what, did Stephen, what did Stephen see? What, what was his experience? Based on what Stephen experienced, we see that he was about to see Jesus face to face. So that tells you what's going to happen when we pass from this life to the next. We're going to see Jesus face to face. He also sees the glory of God. Now we learn, and I think the last teaching that I'm going to do is going to be on hell, and I think we're going to be in Luke chapter 16, and Jesus teaches the story of Lazarus and the rich man. And how Lazarus was a poor beggar and he died and he went to Abraham's bosom. He went to paradise and the rich man, of course, goes to hell and uh, he's in torment in the flames and, and he's suffering. But Jesus says this, he says, he says, the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's bosom. Let me ask you this, was Stephen escorted to heaven by heavenly hosts? It's a very powerful book and powerful movie that came out, oh gosh, uh, over 15, about 13 years ago, and it's called The End of the Spear. And it's about the missionaries, uh, Jim Elliott, Nate Saint, Fleming, I can't remember the other two guys, but it's about the five missionaries and their wives and how they went to Ecuador and how they sought to minister to a specific tribal group. And all five of the men were martyred. Of course, they, they died for Jesus. And what's so fascinating is the lead, the lead uh, tribesman in the tribe that killed the five men, uh, his name is uh, Minkea, Minkea. He ultimately came, came to Christ and just, just a powerful testimony. And Nate Saint's son um, literally just embraced him and forgave him and and just a very powerful, powerful story of, of redemption and how God causes all things to work together for good. 
Yeah, God's, God's perspective of things are, are, are very different than ours. And five very gifted and anointed and called men were taken from this world and died as martyrs. And yet God in his wisdom allowed that to happen. happen. God in his wisdom permitted that. He could have kept it through his power, kept that from happening through his power. But he permitted it. And an entire tribal group was saved. And God has received glory from that time, 1956 onward. What a powerful testimony and how it's motivated hundreds and thousands of people to live wholeheartedly for Christ Jesus. But my point in bringing this up is this, that when... When the missionaries were dying, this tribal leader literally saw the gates of splendor, literally saw heaven open up and saw Jim Elliott and saw Nate Saint and and saw these men who were on the ground with spears in their body. He saw their spirits leaving their bodies and there were angels all around them that escorted them right to the throne of God. And, and he talks about passing the great divide, the great divide. And I won't go into that. And I would encourage you to read it. But it brought, it brought a revelation to me of how real this unseen realm really is. As Paul said in Corinthians, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. What happens the moment you die when you're going to see Jesus face to face? I believe you're going to be escorted by angels. The death, death is a doorway to heaven. Lutzer says, let me move on here. Uh, I'll get to Lutzer again. Revelation 5, 11 and verse 12 says, then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousands times ten thousands. That's a lot of angels. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and, and the elders. In a loud voice, they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Oh, my gosh. Stephen, as he's being stoned, he sees Jesus standing there ready to receive him. And, and Stephen is, is about to die and he forgives, his, forgives those that have killed him and are killing him. And, and all of a sudden he goes from, from a body that's been broken and he leaves with his spirit and he's ushered into the presence of God. And he sees what John saw in Revelation chapter five, what I just read to you. My goodness, beloved, we, we need to set our mind and our hearts on things above where Christ is seated. This is real. This is what's going on right now. We need an understanding of where we're headed. We have a map called the Word of God that's going to keep us on track and that's going to create longing and desire. And, and let me tell you something. When you fall in love with Jesus, we used to sing, I keep falling in love with him over and over and over again. He gets sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Lord and I. I keep falling in love with him over and over again. Beloved, the closer we get to Jesus, the more we're going to long to be with Jesus and see him face to face. Hallelujah. God prevented Adam and Eve from eternal sinfulness by giving them the gift of death. The ability, no, sin is the consequence, death is the consequence of sin. But I believe God in his mercy has allowed, has allowed that death to take believers into his presence. The ability to exit this life and arrive safely in the wondrous life to come. Death, though it would appear to be man's greatest enemy, would in the end prove to be his greatest friend. Only through death can we go to God, unless, of course, we are still living when Christ returns. <laughs> That's a good word. That's a good word. Number three, the spirit leaves and the body stays. So what are we looking at here? Lessons from Stephen's departure. Number one, when our day comes, the Holy Spirit will be with us. Number two, death is a doorway to heaven. And we're going to see in a few weeks, death is a doorway to hell for those that die without Christ. 
for those that die in their sin, for those that do not embrace Jesus as the only remedy for their spiritual condition. There's no world religion that offers a remedy that can, that can literally transform a man and make him ready for God's presence for eternity. The only Christianity, uh, the, uh, Christianity is the only, quote, religion that provides the remedy for fallen man to know the glory of God. And number three, the spirit leaves and the body stays. And this is important. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, to say that he fell asleep, it doesn't mean that that's soul sleep. That's a teaching that I believe is very unscriptural. Jesus says on the cross to the thief, he says, today, today you will be with me in paradise. It says that um, Lazarus, our friend, uh, uh, John 11, verse 11, Lazarus, our friend, has fallen asleep. We are going there to wake him up. He was dead. This is a euphemism for death. Paul talks about this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, about those who have fallen asleep or those who have died. So we see something here that's very important. And again, this is where we have to have the roadmap of God's word to understand our destiny. And scripture, as I'm going to show you, teaches that it's not soul sleep. No, when we die, our spirit leaves our body and we go into the presence of God. Look at this in verse two. It says, godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. As long as the spirit of the believer remains within, it cannot be, be in the immediate presence of the Lord. Death unlocks the spirit from the body and enters into the presence of the Lord. Death is merely a transition in the journey of the believer. Godly men buried Stephen. This could be written as follows. The body of Stephen was buried. Stephen was now in the presence of the Lord. Every time I've done a funeral, and I've done many, but every time I've done a funeral and officiated a funeral, I've talked about the shell of a man, the shell of the woman, that, that the person in this coffin is not here. This is just the body. This is just, just the, the container for the spirit. As it says in James chapter 2, the body, like the body that's dead without the spirit is faith without works. So when the spirit leaves a man's body, he's dead. He's dead. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 6 says, to be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord. Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 talks about eternity, talks about the things that I'm speaking about right now. He says in verse 8, we are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So you're thinking, okay, when a person dies in Christ, immediately their spirit goes into the presence of the Lord. There's a journey. <laughs> Maybe there's a chariot. I don't know, but I'm going to tell you something. It is going to be better than anything we've ever experienced on the road in any type of car that we may have driven in a roller coaster. I'm telling you, Elijah went up there in a chariot of fire. God has something very, very special for each one of us. And I pray in Jesus' name for long life. I pray that everyone that hears my voice would have the grace of God to be fruitful and to bear fruit, even in old age. That you guys that are in your teens and 20s, you would have vision for a long life and to be a fruit-bearing uh, uh, son of God who will live for the glory of God and advance the kingdom of God that there will be no wrong turns to the left or the right because of sinful desires and temptation that would take you down a path of destruction. But there would be this highway of holiness that you would walk on all the days of your life, that there would be just a, a path of righteousness that the Lord would lead you on, that would protect you from premature death. Yes, premature death. 
I pray for this body that we would be a people that, that take care of the temple of the Holy Spirit, that, that, that really embrace um, uh, quality habits that, that will not lend to breaking natural laws that in, uh, uh, impact our health and ultimately take us from this earth prematurely. I'm going to tell you something. I've known some pastors that, that have not taken care of themselves and they have died, I believe, prematurely died of a heart attack and died of diabetes. The man I worked with many years ago was, was not in good health and not in good shape, and he just loved sugar. And that man, he died of diabetes in 2001. And I believe he still had some time left on his journey. Please hear what I'm saying. We need to take this seriously. And we don't, we don't need to go down a path of self-destruction because we don't take care of our temple and we fall short of God's plan. Or, or we're just too weak and too frail to literally put our hands to our plow and do the will of God in the field that God has called us to, to take care of and nurture. Beloved, I'm telling you, we need to fight the good fight of faith. And that includes taking care of one's temple. That includes uh, building a history with God. That includes uh, building relationship and community because we need one another. And God wants to just empower us with revelation. And I'm telling you right now, as, I, as I've meditated on so many passages, and I'll share these with you in the coming weeks, I'll share with you the dynamic of these passages that just grip my heart. It just, it just brings me back to 1981, and there was a Maranatha song, Maranatha 2, I believe it was. And there's a song, and, and it speaks of, it, the title of the song was, Come Quickly, Jesus. Come Quickly, Jesus. And, and the singer singing, you know, it's time for you to come. It's time to go to heaven, so on and so forth. And then the Spirit of God breaks in on the song and says, the Lord says, wait, I want to save a few more souls. And then the last line is, the Lord says, wait, I want to save one more soul. And beloved, when I get an understanding of heaven and I see Jesus and I see the glory and there's no tears and there's no death and there's no sickness and there's no, there's no COVID-19, there's no war, there's none of that there. When I see it, I just think of souls. I think of people who are lost, who are a breath away from hell. I think of how many people out of 500,000 plus who have died in the last 11 months, how many were prepared for death? How many many were ready to die? How many died in their sin? How many are in the presence of, of, of the departed people who have died in their sin and now they're in hell awaiting the great throne, the great white throne judgment? That grips me. And this message is to comfort us. It's to empower us. Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled, neither be fearful. Believe in God, believe also in me. I go and prepare up in my father's house or many dwellings or many mansions. And I, if it were not so, I would tell you. And I go and prepare a place for you. Yes, he's preparing a place for us. But I'm telling you, there are nations and multitudes of people that need to be reached. Let this revelation of heaven grip your heart and bring you into a place like Jim Elliott and Nate Sane and those five that died in Ecuador. Bring you into a place of availability where you say like Isaiah, here am I. Here am I, send me. Let me walk across the street and tell my neighbor about heaven and how to get there. Let me tell my co-worker who I see every day and I haven't talked to that co-worker about Jesus. I want to get over my fear of man and I'm going to go alongside my co-worker and say, can I talk to you about Jesus? Jesus. Can I tell you about my Jesus? The family members that we haven't witnessed to and shared with, let me talk to you about my Jesus. Let me tell you how he's changed my life because I'm telling you, just as sure as you see my face, there are people that you know that are going to perish, that are going to die in their sin, and we need to go for souls, and we need to minister the compassion of Christ to them. It stirs me. Oh, Pastor, you look excited. I'm, I am gripped by eternity. I am gripped by the revelation of what the word of God says. I'm gripped by this message. I don't know how adequately I'm communicating to you about heaven, but I know this, it's real. The body, Derek Prince says, the body is raised up by resurrection from death. Spirit and body are thus reunited and the complete personality of man is reconstituted. And I'm going to talk about the resurrection and how God's going to give us a new body. 
Oh, that's going to be a good day. No bad knees. Amen. No bad backs. We're almost done. Hebrews 12, 22 and 23. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. The heavenly Jerusalem. We'll talk about how heaven's going to come to earth. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels and joy. Look what it says, joyful assembly. Man, there's such a sound. There's such a sound in heaven. There's a sound in heaven. Luke 15, it speaks of the angels that rejoice over the repentance of one sinner. There's a sound of joy. There's a sound. There's an elation. There is an unspeakable glory and joy that, that is perpetual, that continues to flow. Oh my gosh, let me read on here. To the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven, you have come to God, the judge of all. Look at this. To the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Now, those are the ones that are in heaven. Shh. Let's finish up. Why is death such a blessing? Erwin Lutzer says, and you're going, are you serious? Why is death such a blessing? Well, Paul said, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. The fact is that you and I can't go to heaven just as we are today. No matter how alert and prime, no matter how neatly we have showered and dressed, we are not fit for heaven. You can't have a decaying body in a permanent home. Death rescues us from the endlessness of this existence. It is the means by which those who love God finally are brought to him. Paul had no illusions as to whether heaven was better than earth. He was itching to depart and be with Christ, which is by, by far better. Even our heroic attempts to live one day longer with respirators and, and other high-tech equipment would seem unnecessary if we could see what awaits us. Remember what I said after my sister died and the Holy Spirit spoke to me? I shared this last week and the Holy Spirit just totally neutralized an offended heart because I was so offended at God because my sister died at 41 and left a two-year-old and a husband. And that two-year-old three weeks later after, after my sister died was diagnosed with leukemia. And the Holy Spirit said, if you could see who Christy sees and what she sees, you would never want her back. When I die, Greg, am I going to continue to be a man? Yeah. Yeah. We see this in, in Luke 9. Jesus meets with, uh, actually, it's not Luke 9. Yes, it is Luke 9. Jesus uh, meets with Elijah and with Moses. They didn't change sex. There's no marriage. Mormonism falsely teaches that there will be marriage in heaven. Jesus says there won't be marriage in, in heaven. There will be a marriage supper of the Lamb, which we will talk about. The, the bride of Christ, the church, the body of Christ will be married to Jesus. Now, you've got to wrap your mind around that. It's very powerful. It's very deep. Muy, muy profundo. But you will, you will have the same personality. You will be a man or you will be a woman. Listen, there's only two sexes. God created them male and female. And in heaven, there'll be people that are either male or female. Very important revelation for this day and age, by the way. Amen. The identity of a man, the identity of a woman. And if anyone doesn't understand their identity, I can help them understand it through the word of God. But listen to what Mike Bickle says, and I end with this. Who you are in Christ Jesus will be who you are in the age to come. You will be you. Your ethnicity and gender will be the same for eternity. The one exception is everything pertaining to the Adamic nature will be completely removed. Lust, anger, rejection issues, pride, jealousy, etc. will have no place any longer in your personality. Boy, we could write a big list, couldn't we? No addictions in heaven, amen? the moment you die. Question for you, are you ready to die? You may not know me, you may not know 
the ministry of King of the Nations, but somehow, some way, you tuned in and you're not prepared to die. You're like I was almost 40 years ago, dead in sin, separated from God, hoping that my goodness would make a way for being right with God. And our goodness is like filthy rags. The Bible says we've all come short of the glory of God. The Bible says every human being on the planet is guilty. We're all lawbreakers. We've all broken the law of God. and We come short of his glory. And God loved us so much that he became one of us, and that's called the incarnation. And Jesus literally came to earth, born of a virgin, grew up as a man, and at the age of 30, he began his ministry. He went about doing good, healing all those oppressed by the devil. He, he came to reveal who the Father was. He came to put a face on God. He came to say, listen, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And people were touched and people were healed and set free. Miraculous things happened. God demonstrated his love through this man, this God-man, Christ Jesus. And at the end of his three years of ministry, he fulfilled every Old Testament prophetic word, every Old Testament promise about a Messiah. He fulfilled every one, starting in Genesis chapter 3. And this man who was God, he died on a cross for you. Your sin, my sin, humanity's sin, put him on that cross. Because the only remedy for our sin, sin is like a cancer. It's a cancer you, you, you can't get rid of. No human effort will remove the cancer of sin. Only the blood of Jesus. And listen, there was real blood in that real flesh, and he shed his blood on the cross for you so that you would not taste the fires of hell, but so that you might spend eternity with him and receive a rich welcome when you die. And so today, I just ask you to surrender your life to Christ. How do we do that? We just say, I'm a sinner and I need a savior and I want to turn from my way of living because it's not getting me anywhere. It's taking me further and further into darkness. And that's what sin does. Sin leads us into deeper darkness. But Jesus can get us out of that darkness right now and just open your heart and just say, Jesus, come into my heart and my life. Be my Lord. Be my savior. Forgive me. I turn from my sin and I turn to you. Save me today. Save me today. In Jesus' name. Church, my heart is stirred. <sighs> this is a good word. And we'll spend a few more weeks on it and get us established and get, get the destination established in our heart and give us under. See, this isn't just for us. It's for those around us. It's for the nations. We got to tell people about heaven and about this God-man who died and rose again and is seated at the right side of the Father's glory. I want to encourage you to give. You know, I, I, I haven't had to say a lot about giving because you guys have been real faithful. And you, you need to see what's been done in the children's building next door. Seriously, seriously. It's beautiful. Our kids are going to be so happy. And so we got some things planned coming up. We'll be talking about that. And uh, just give as the Lord directs you. Uh, don't hold back. Be generous. And pour your heart and your life into this ministry. The life groups are going very, very well. Lives are being changed. If you're in the Through the Bible Life group, start reading Titus. We'll be in there uh, in a week from this Wednesday. I love you. I'll see you soon. Amen.